Today, I'm going to be reading Chapter 5 of Hiroshima by John Hersey. This chapter is titled, The Aftermath. Hatsui Nakamura. Hatsui Nakamura, weak and astute, began a courageous struggle, which would last her for many years, to keep her children and herself alive. She had her rusted Sunuku machine repaired and begun to take in some sewing. And she did cleaning and laundry and washed dishes for the neighbors who were somewhat better off than she was. But she got so tired that she had to take two days rest for every three days she worked. And if she was obligated for some reason to work for a whole week, she had then to rest for three or four days. She earned barely enough for food, and in the the precarious time she fell ill. Her belly began to swell up, and she had diarrhea, and so much pain she could no longer work at all. A doctor who lived nearby came to see her and told her that she had roundworm, and she and he said incorrectly, if it bites your intestine, you'll die. In those days, there was a shortage of chemical fertilizers in Japan, so farmers were using night soil. As a consequence, many people began to harbor parasites, which were not fatal in themselves, but were seriously debilitating to those who had, had radi- radiation sickness. The doctor treated Nakamura San as he would have addressed her with Santonian, a somewhat dangerous medicine derived from certain varieties of art Misa. To pay the doctor, she was forced to sell her last valuable possession, her husband's sewing machine. She came to think of the act as marking the lowest and saddest moment in, of her whole life. In referring to those who went through the bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, the Japanese tended to shy away from the term survivors because in its focus on being alive, it might suggest some slight to the sacred dead, the class of people to which Nakasaka, Na- Nakamura Sam belonged came, therefore to be called by a more neutral name, Hibusake, Hibusake literally explosion affecting persons. For more than a decade after the bombing, the Hibusake lived in an economic limbo, apparently because the Japanese government did not want to find itself settled with anything like moral responsibility for her heinous acts of victorious of the victorious united states although it soon became clear that many hubusake suffered consequences in nature and degree from those of the survivors even the ghastly fire bombings in tokyo and elsewhere the government made no special provision for their relief and so ironically after the storm of rage that swept across Japan, when 23 crewmen of a fishing vessel, the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5, and its cargo of tuna were raided by American test of hydrogen bomb at Bikini in 1954. It took three years even for the relief law for Hubusake to pass the diet. Though Nakamura-san could not know it, she thus had a bleak period ahead of her. In Hiroshima, the early post-war years were besides a time especially painful for poor people like her, of disorder, hunger, greed, thievery, black markets. Non-Hibasku employers developed a prejudice against the survivors as a word got around as they were prone to all sorts of alignments, and not even those, like Nakamura-san, like Nakamura-san, who were not cruelly maimed and, not, and had not developed any serious overt s- symptoms were unreliable workers, since most of them seemed to suffer, as she did, from the mysterious but real malaise that came to be known as one of the lasting, a bomb sickness, a nagging weakness, and weary and weariness and weariness, dizziness now and then, digestive troubles, all eradicated by a feeling of oppression, a sense of doom, for it was said that the unspeakable diseases might at any time, plant nasty flowers in the bodies of their victim, victims, and even in those of their descendants. As Nakamura-san struggled to get from day to day, she had no time for attitudes about the bomb or anything else. She was sustained, cur- curiously, by a kind of passivity, summed it up in a phrase she herself sometimes used, Saka Gane, meaning loosely, it can't be helped, she was not religious, but she lived in a culture long colored by Buddhist belief that re- that resignation might lead to clear vision. 
she had shared with other citizens a deep feeling of powerlessness in the face of a state authority that had been divinely strung, strung ever since the Magi restory, restoration in 1868. And the hell she had witnessed and terrible aftermath unfolding around her reached so far beyond human understanding that it was impossible to think as the work resent, resent, resentable President Truman or the scientists who had made the bomb or even nearer at hand the Japanese militarists who had helped to bring on war. The bomb almost seemed a natural disaster, one that sim that had simply been her bad luck, her fate, which must have been accepted, to suffer when she had warmed and felt slightly better. She made an arrangement to deliver bread for a baker named Takashika, Shikai, whose bakery was Norbo Cho on days when she had the strength to do it. She would take orders for bread from retail shops in her neighborhood. And then the next morning, she would pick up a resequent number of loaves and carry them in baskets and in boxes through the streets to the stores. It was exhausting work, for which she had earned the equivalent of about 50 cents a day. She had to take frequent rest days. After some time, when she was feeling a bit stronger, she took up another kind of pedaling. She would get up, in the dark and tremble to a borrowed two-wheeled pushing cart for two hours across the city to a section called Iba. At the mouth of one of the seven estuarial rivers that branch from the Odo River through Hiroshima, there a daylight fisherman would cast their leading skirt-like nets for sardines, and she wouldn't help them to gather up the catch when they hauled it in. Then she would push the cart back to Nova Cho and sell the fish, from door to door. She earned just enough food a couple of years later. She found work that was better suited to, to her need for occasional rest, because within certain limits she would do it on her own time. This was a job of collecting money for deliveries of Hiroshima paper, the Chudnak Subun, which most people in the city read. She had to cover a, a big territory, and often her clients were not home or pleaded when they couldn't pay just then. So she would have to go back again and again. She earned the equivalent of about $20 a month to, at this job. Every day, her willpower and her weariness seemed to flight to an uneasy draw. In 1951, after the years of drudgery, in Nakamura-san's good luck, her fate, which must be accepted, to become eligible to move into a better house. Two years earlier, a Quaker professor of dendrology <clears throat> from the University of Washington named Floyd W. Schmo, driven apparently by deep urges for exemptation and reconciliation, had come to Hiroshima, assembled a team of carpenters, and with his own hands and theirs, begun building a series of Japanese-style houses for victims of the bomb. In all, his team eventually built 21 it was one of these homes that Nakamura-san had the good fortune to be assigned. The Japanese measured their houses by multiple of the area of the floor covering tube zone map, a little less than four squares, four square yards. And Dr. Sumo O houses, Dr. Shum O house, Dr. Shumo houses, as the Hiroshimians called them, had two rooms of six mats each. This was a big step up from the Nakamura's. This home was redolent of new wood and clean matting. The rent payable to the city government was equivalent of about a dollar a month. Despite the family's poverty, the children seemed to be growing normally. Yekio and Mayo, the two daughters, were an addict, but all three had so far escaped any of the more serious complications that so many young Hibushake were suffering. Yeko, now 14, and Maiko, 11, were in middle school. The boy, Dashio, ready to enter high school, was going to earn money to attend it. So he took up delivering papers to places from which his mother was collecting. These were some distances from Dr. Shumo House's house, and they had to commute at odd hours by streetcar. The old hut in Nurbo Cho stood empty for a time, 
and while continuing with her newspaper collections, Nakamura-san converted it into a small street shop for children, selling selling sweet potatoes, which she roasted in dashuke or little candies and rice cakes, and cheap toys, which she brought from a wholesaler. All along, she had been collecting for papers from a small company, Sumaya Chemical, that made mothballs work there. And one day, the friend suggested to Nakamura, saying that she she joined the company, helping wrap the product in its packages. The owner, Nakamura, saying, learned was a compassionate man who did not share the bias of many employers against Hubushake. He had several of his staff on 20 women wrappers. Nakamura-san objected that she couldn't work more than a few days at a time. The friend persuaded her that Mr. Sumeya would understand, so she began. Dressed in company uniforms, the woman stood somewhat bent over on either side of a couple of conveyor belts, working as fast as possible to wrap two kinds of perigen in cellophane. Perigen had a dizzling odor and made first one's eyes smart. Its sub- sub- substance, powdery bilocabizine, had compressed into lodging-shaped mothballs and into larger spheres the size of small oranges to be hung in Japanese-style toilets, which were rank persuado medical, medical and smell that would offset the unpleasantness of the non-flushing facilities. Nakamura-san was paid as a beginner 100 and 70 yen, then less than 50 cents a day at first. The work was confusing, terribly tiring, and a bit sickening. Her boss worried about her paleness. She had to take many days off, but little by little she became used to the factory. She made friends. There was a family atmosphere. She got got raises. In the two 10-minute breaks, morning and afternoon, when the moving belt stopped, there was a bird song of gossip and laughter in which she joined. It appeared that all along there had been there had been deep in temperament, a core of cheerfulness which had must have fulfilled her long flight against a bomb lassitude. Something warmer and more vivifying than were submissions them saying Sabu Gana the other woman took to her she was constantly doing them small favors. They began calling her affectionately. Abu San, roughly, auntie. She worked at Sumea for 13 years, though her energy still paid its dues, time from time, to the Abam uh, syndrome, then shearing experiences of the day in 1945, seemed gradually to be receding from the front of her mind. The Lucky Dragon number 5 episode took place in 1954, the year after Nakamura-san started working for Suma Chemical. In the ensuring fever of outrage in the countries, in the country, per, the provision of adequate medical care for the victims of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs finally became a political issue. Almost every year since 1946, on the anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing, a peace memorial meeting had been held in the park that the city planners had set aside. During the city's rebuilding, as a center of remembrance, on August 6, 1955, delegates from all over the world gathered there for the first world conference against atomic and hydrogen bombs. On its second day, a number of Hubusakin tearfully testified to the government's neglect of their plight. Japanese political parties took up a cause, and in 1957, the diet at last pa- passed the A-bomb victims' medical care law. This law and its subsequent modifications defined four classes of people who would be eligible for the support. Those who had been in the city limits on the day of the bombing. Those who had centered an area within two kilometers of the hypocenter in the first 14 days after it. Those who had become into physical contact with the bomb victims and in administrating first aid or, or in disposing of their bodies. And those who had been embryos in the wombs of women in any of the first three categories. These habusakin were entitled to receive 
so-called health books, which would later entitle them to a free medical treatment. Later revisions of the law provided the monthly allowances to victims suffering from various after effects. Like a great many Hubisakin, Namara San had kept away from all agitation. And in fact, also like many other survivors, she did not even bother to get health book to get a health book from a couple of years after they were issued. She had been too poor to keep going to doctors and she had got into a habit of coping alone as the best she could with whatever allowed an LA of her. Besides, she shared with some of the other survivors a, a suspicion of alternate motives on the part of a political-minded people who took part in annual ce- ce- cere- ceremonies and conferences. Nakamura San's son, Toshio, right after his graduation from high school, went to work for the bus division of the Japanese National Railways. He was in, he was in the administrating office, offices working as the timetables, later in accounting. When he was in his mid-twenties, a marriage was arranged for him through a relative who knew the bride's family. He built an additional uh, addition to Dr. Shum, Shumo's house, moved in, and began to contribute to his mother's support. He made her, her a present of, new, of a new sewing machine. Yekio, the oldest daughter, left Hiroshima when she was 15, right after graduating from middle school to help her ailing aunt who ran from Rokan, a Japanese-style inn. There in due course, she fell in love with a man who ate at the inn's restaurant, and she made a love marriage. After graduating from high school, Miko, the most accessible of the three to the A-bomb syndrome, eventually became an expert typist and took up instruction at typing schools. In time, a marriage was arranged for her. Like their mother, all three children avoided Prohibusaki and um, anticular agitation. In 1966, Nakamura-san, having the reached age of 55, retired from the Suman chemical. At the end, she was being paid 30,000 yen, or about $85, or $85 a month. Her children were no longer dependent on her, and Toshio was ready to take on take on a son's responsibility for his aging mother. She felt at the son's responsibility for his aging mother. She felt at home in her body now. She rested when she needed to, and she had no worries about the cost of medical care, for she had finally picked up a health book number 103993. It was time for her to enjoy life, for her pleasure in being able to give gifts. She took up embroidery, and dressed such of traditional kimokomi da dolls, which are su- supposed to bring good luck. Wearing a bright kimono, she went once a week to dance at the study group of Japanese folk music. In set movements with expressive gestures, her hands now and then tucking up along folds of kimo sleeves. And with her, held, with her head held high, she danced, moving as if floated, with 30 agreeable women to a song of celebration of the entrance into a house. May your family flourish for a thousand generations, for 8,000 generations. About a year after Nakamura San retired, she was invited by an organization called Bereaved Families Association to take a train trip with about 100 other war widows to visit the Yakushimin Shrine in Tokyo. This holy place, established in 18. 18- 69, was dedicated to the spirits of all Japanese who had died in wars against foreign powers. That could be thought through in in Elias in terms of its symbolism for the nation. To Arlington National Cemetery, with the different souls, not bodies, were hollowed there. The shrine was considered by many Japanese to be focus of still smoldering Japanese militarism. But Nakamura San, who had never seen her husband's ashes and had held on to the belief that he would return to her someday, was oblivious of all that. She found the visit baffling. Besides the Hiroshima Hundred, there were huge crowds of women from other cities on the shrine grounds. It was impossible for her to 
summon up a sense of her dead husband's presence, and she returned home in an uneasy state of mind. Japan was booming. Things were still rather tight for the Nakamoras, and Toshio had to work very long hours. But old days of bitter struggle began to seem remote. In 1975, one of the laws providing support to the Hakushiken was revised, and Nakamura-san began to receive a so-called health protection allowance of 6,000 yen, then about $20 a month. This would gradually be increased to more than twice that, the, twice that amount. She also received a pension towards what she had contributed at Tsumaya of 20,000 yen, or $65 a month. And for several years, she had been re- receiving a widow, uh, war widow's pension of 20,000 yen a month with an economic upswing. Prices had, of course, risen steeply. In a few years, Tokyo would become the most expensive city in the world. But Toshio managed to buy a small Mitsubishi car. And occasionally, he got up before dawn and rode a train for two hours to play golf with business associates. Yakamuka's husband ran a shop for sales and service of all the conditioners and heaters, and Mayo's husband ran a newsstand and candy shop near the railroad station. In May each year, around the same time of the emperor's birthday, when the trees along the border, Peace Boulevard, were at their feathery best and banked azaleas, were everywhere in bloom, Hiroshima celebrated a flower festival. Entertainment booths lined the boulevard and were held long parades with floats and bands and thousands of marchers. In the 40th year of the bombing, Nakamura-san danced with the woman of the folk dance associate. Six dancers in each of the 60 rows, they danced to Awi Ando, a song of happiness, lifting their arms in gestures of joy, clapping in rhythms of three. Green pine trees, cranes and turtles, you must tell a story of your hard times and laugh twice. The bombing had been four decades ago, how far away it seemed. The sun blazed that day, the measured steps and consistent lifting of arms for hours at a time were tiring. In the mid-afternoon, Nakamura-san suddenly felt woozy. The The next thing she knew, she was being lifted in her great embarrassment and the spite of begging, to be let alone in an ambulance at the hospital. She was she was fine. All she wanted was to go home. She was allowed to leave. That's all for today. Thank you for watching.